Welcome everybody back. Um, hope your week went well. We're continuing to our study of the book of Revelation. If my voice sounds a little different, uh, I'm not an imposter. I've been sick with a cold for a while. It hit me pretty hard in the lungs and uh, in the throat, which is why we've taken some time off from uh, putting these messages on podcast. But feeling about 70 to 80% now, back to normal. And so we're going to continue on. Of course, our hope is that uh, we can go through the entire Bible, book by book, chapter by chapter, and verse by verse. Um, so, uh, we continue on, the book of Revelation. Uh, we are going to be talking about now the church of Thyatira. This is the fourth of seven churches. Of course, the seven churches that Jesus wrote letters to, chapters 2 and 3 of the book of Revelation. And so, again, just as... A reminder, there were more than seven churches at that time. The church in Jerusalem, the church in Corinth, the church in Galatia. <coughs> maybe a hundred churches or more at the time. But Jesus chose these seven churches because when you study them in their order, not only do they reveal church history uh, exactly, as we look back, we can see that. But also, if you want to judge the spiritual condition of any church, you can go to one of these seven letters and you'll find it there. And uh, that's not to say that we go around judging churches, but when you're curious, something strange going on, you could reread these letters and always find out uh, the depths of what's going on and, uh, you know, what part, what area of the Bible they might be violating as far as uh, the way Jesus uh, wanted the structure of a church to be, which the model church, of course, is the Church of Philadelphia. And uh, we'll get to that one in, in a couple of weeks. But if you remember, <clears throat> Jesus had one thing against the first church. That was the first, uh, the church of Ephesus. And uh, what he had against them is that they had left their first love. And they never repented. And that church doesn't exist anymore. Um, he had nothing against the church of Smyrna. He only said that as they were going through persecution, that they should continue uh, going down the road that they were going, um, persecution was going to continue. Of course, it happened throughout uh, the generations of 10 Roman emperors there. Um, they were persecuted, but they kept their faith. And of course, that church doesn't exist anymore. And then he had a few things against the church of Pergamos, the church that we studied last week. Um, their perverted uh, marriage, uh, that is idolatry. Uh, spiritual, sexual immorality, we talked about that, and the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, and that church does not exist anymore. You know, if you're just scrolling through the podcast and you haven't gone through the studies of the other churches, you might not have a grasp of what we're talking about here, but you can go back and start with the first church in Revelation chapter 2, verse 1, and kind of catch up. Uh, you almost have to study them in sequence. To uh, if you want to get a broad perspective of what Jesus is talking about and why he addresses these churches the way that he does, uh, it would be worth your time. I can tell you that. Well, now he has a few things against this fourth church, the church of Thyatira. What does he hold against this church? Well, he says that there's a woman named Jezebel that's going around teaching false doctrine. And uh, she's seducing people to... To spiritual sexual immorality. What is that? Well, we're going to talk about that in a few minutes. <clears throat> this church still exists, unlike the other three. And we know that because in verse 22 of uh, the study of this church of Thyatira in, in chapter 2, Jesus says that they will be on earth for the great tribulation. Well, the great tribulation has not happened yet. We're not going to see that until we get to Revelation chapter 6 through 19. And the uh, Great Tribulation is not going to begin until the true church of Jesus Christ is raptured. And we know that has not happened yet. So the church of Thyatira, which really is the Catholic church, you'll see that. And by the way, if you have a Catholic background, maybe you're still in, involved in the Catholic church today. You might be 
a little offended at what is said here in this letter. Keep in mind that the next church, the Church of Sardis, is the denominational church, the Protestant church. And while Jesus has a few good things to say to the Church of Thyatira, the, the, the Catholic church, he has not one good thing to say about the Church of Sardis. So plenty to be offended uh, with in, in all of these letters, each one of us individually and every church throughout history. Um, but the Church of Thyatira, the Catholic church here, describes the spiritual condition of the church throughout history from the year 600 A.D. to the year 1500 A.D., 900 long years. And most of these years were known as the Dark Ages uh, because in those days there was hardly no middle class uh, at all, kind of the way America is going now. And uh, the wealthy people were mostly the religious leaders and politicians. They had the money. They had the power. They controlled religion. They controlled government. I mean, what more could you want for, to control the world? Um, most people, most poor people back then, they couldn't read. They were, they were illiterate. They couldn't write. Um, and it was illegal to possess Bibles. That's right. The Catholic Church made it that way. <coughs> and of course, <clears throat> if you decided that you wanted to argue against um, any of the traditions that the Catholic Church, the Church of Thyatira, um, was involved in or that, that they um, uh, participated in, then what they would do is they would simply charge you with heresy and uh, you would be tortured and you could recant your statements or if not, you would be killed. You say, well, what would they want to uh, uh, dispute? What, what traditions violated the Bible? Well, how about purgatory? This idea that the Catholic Church preaches and teaches that when a Catholic person, who is a Christian person, by the way, when, uh, when they die, they don't go directly to, to heaven. They got to go to purgatory where they suffer for the sins they committed here on earth. Well, the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. The Bible says that, the, uh, that Jesus Christ offering himself unto death by way of the cross paid the price for all of our sins. And then, of course, there were the indulgences. When you could pay a cardinal or a priest or the pope or whatever, you could pay them money in advance, give them gold or coins or whatever it was, valuables, and then you could go off that weekend and sin all you want. You could participate in whatever sin you wanted to, and it was fine. You would be forgiven because the priest gave you the okay to do it. These are the kinds of things that some people were speaking, and they said, this is not right, this is not right, and they were doing it anyway. And a lot of those people were tortured and or uh, killed. Well, these years were also the time of the Inquisitions. And so if the government or the church wanted what you had, they just brought you to court with false charges, of course, and they took your land or whatever possessions that they wanted because they controlled the court, they controlled the government, they controlled uh, religion. And it wasn't very difficult to do if you were dealing with an illiterate population uh, who never owned Bibles. And uh, all they had to go on is whatever the priests would, uh, would tell them. And so <clears throat> for that reason, the church became, and actually the church, the Catholic Church today, remains one of the wealthiest organizations on the planet. Uh, of course, the Pope then and even now, a lot of people don't talk about it, but it is true, that the Pope was then and now the Vicar of Christ on earth. And so he was the religious, uh, religious power and the government power on earth. The Vicar of Christ being um, that when the Pope sat on his throne, whatever he pronounced was law. And so uh, when he pronounced uh, the indulgences legal, when he pronounced purgatory, all of these things became uh, law. And so, you know, the major problem uh, with this church in Thyatira, the root of these problems that we've already discussed was an actual woman named Jezebel. Nobody really knows. Or was it the spirit or this practice of a, a false prophet named Jezebel that we find in the Old Testament? Um, we'll get into that here in a minute. Uh, what we know, uh, at least in, in, a, in, in a small way, about the actual city of Thyatira, uh, from historians like Tertullian and what we read in the book of Acts, chapter 16. <coughs> in fact, let me read it to you. Um, 
in Acts chapter 16, verses 14 to 15, Thyatira is uh, mentioned when Paul and uh, Silas and Timothy, they were preaching at the city of Philippi. And it says there in the book of Acts that a certain woman named Lydia heard us. She was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira who worshiped God. So she was a sincere woman, sincere about her Christianity. And uh, it says that the Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. And when she and her household were baptized, she begged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she persuaded us. So from then, Paul and these guys, they go to the city of Thyatira. They start preaching in the synagogues, in the streets, the way that they always did. And uh, there was a church plant in Thyra. In Thyatira, I should say. So Thyatira was a small city, but it was a business center. And one of the businesses that it specialized in was the manufacturing or the sale of purple cloth. And it was very expensive because it was a, a, hard, a difficult process, I should say, to manufacture purple. And it was, it was tedious. It was time consuming. What they would do is they would get these, uh, these sea snails. And they would draw the mucus from them. I don't know how they did that. And they would crush their shells and they would mix it with this alkaline uh, solution. Um, they heated it. And then, of course, when it turned purple or scarlet, then they would dip yarn into it. And then once the yarn was uh, dried in the sun, it became purple. And so not a big city. It wasn't a big city like some of the other ones. But uh, it was very wealthy and mostly because of the color uh, purple. And so if you see today a priest or a cardinal or a pope and they're wearing purple and scarlet, you wonder, why are they wearing a purple or scarlet hat or socks or a belt or a sash or whatever? What, what, what's with the color scarlet? Well, now you know. It comes from the city of uh, Thyatira where the Catholic Church was birthed. And so Thyatira was also known for its business guilds. And these business guilds were like workers' unions or, or maybe like a chamber of commerce uh, today. And if you weren't a part of this network uh, with all of these other business and, you know, these businesses that hired employees and the employees that stuck together like a union, if you weren't a part of all that, then it became difficult, if not impossible, to get a job or to be part of the network if you owned a, a business. But if you were part of it, you did well on one hand. On the other hand, you had to believe and you had to practice and you had to promote the same false beliefs that they did. And of course, this was a big problem for any Christian who was not willing to compromise, kind of like unions today. <coughs> Many unions today, you know, you've got to pay dues to belong to a union. And then they'll take a portion of the dues that you've paid. Sometimes it's in the millions, tens of millions, and they'll donate it to a godless politician. A politician who stands for uh, adult, uh, for uh, abortion or for homosexual marriage or for other things. And you say, well, that's not the president that I support. And they say, well, too bad. You're part of this union. Yeah, well, I don't believe in killing babies. Well, it's too bad. You're part of the union. You've paid your dues and we're going to use a portion of the, of the, of the dues that you've paid. And, and we're going to give it to this uh, presidential person, whatever, governor, whatever it is. And you have nothing to say about it. Well, kind of like that back then. Only uh, maybe a little bit more intense than that. Um, one last thing before we get into our study of this church. In the Bible, when God speaks of, uh, of sexual immorality and adultery and fornication, in the way of spiritual things, okay, it's about both the physical and the spiritual. Because many false religious practices did include prostitution and orgies, even bestiality. But also, whenever God's people would worship other gods, God saw that as adultery. In the Old Testament, God speaks of himself as the husband of Israel. In the New Testament, the church is the bride of Christ. So you see, when Jewish people are practicing idolatry, or when Christians are, God sees that as his people cheating on him. And uh, he can be a jealous husband. So, and that's because he loves us so much. So keep that in mind as we're going through this. Now, as much 
again, as it is possible, I, I hope that, that nobody would get offended at our study here of this church of Thyatira because this describes the spiritual condition, again, from the year 600 A.D. to the year 1500 A.D., and it is the Catholic Church, for sure. And uh, just like it was with the Church of Pergamos from 313 to 600 A.D., Christianity is still the official uh, religion of Rome. We talked about that last time. And if you're offended, again, you can come back next week because the Protestant Church is going to get it worse. You know, the Protestant Church that began with, uh, with Martin Luther. Well, let's get into our study now of the Church of Thyatira. First, we want to look at the name because that's always an indication of the spiritual condition of the church. The word Thyatira can mean one of two things. Daughter, which makes a lot of sense because tradition says that when a Roman emperor conquered Thyatira uh, for the Roman Empire, at that same time he received news of the birth of his daughter. And so he named the city Thyatira, which means daughter. But the word Thyatira can also mean continual sacrifice. You say, well, what does that have to do with anything? Well, when you step back and look at that, Thyatira, this church that Jesus writes this letter to, uh, that word meaning continual sacrifice, it might be a pretty good name for the Catholic Church whose traditions and practices include Jesus still hanging from the cross, and their doctrine of purgatory and the Mass and the Eucharist, where Jesus is sacrificed again and again and again, continual sacrifice might be a pretty good name in the way of describing uh, this church. Uh, we know that Jesus re was resurrected from the dead. He is not still hanging from the cross. We know that Jesus died for our sins once and for all. But some of the practices of the Catholic Church contrast that idea. And when you contrast that idea, it is no wonder that you are preaching and teaching these doctrines that cause you to have to suffer and do all kinds of strange practices, uh, repetitive prayers and the rosary and all of these things. The Eucharist, when the priest holds it up, they call it transubstantiation it becomes miraculously the actual body of Christ. And the wine or the juice in the cup becomes actually the blood of Jesus Christ. Well, that is not so. That is not true. And so, in, 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 you know, when we step back and look at all this, what are they doing? They're crucifying Jesus over and over and over again. Hence, continual sacrifice, right? Well, <clears throat> let's jump right into it. Revelation chapter 2, we'll pick it up in verse 18, but let's pray first. Father, we... Thank you for your word. And you, Lord, knowing all things about every individual Christian, we ask you, Father, to forgive us, of course, but Lord, to change us, to change us, to really transform our lives. Were those things that we do that cause you offense, Lord, that it would cause us even more offense enough to just stop it, to say, Jesus sees me. And I don't want to be left behind when the rapture comes. I don't want to go through the tribulation. I don't want to have to suffer needlessly. I want to give the Lord my whole life free of idolatry, free of spiritual adultery, free of evil thoughts and words that come out of my mouth and things that I do. Lord, help us, save us, we pray, and that we would have a heart to do our part as well. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, these things says the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. <coughs> I know your works, love, service, faith, and your patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. So you're doing better and better. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, a female prophet, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols and i gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality and she did not repent indeed the lord says i will cast her into a sickbed and those who commit adultery with her so those who uh, support it or, or participate 
he says, and those who commit adultery with her into the great tribulation, which hasn't happened yet, unless they repent of their deeds, I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts, and I will give to each one of you according to your works. Now, to you I say, and to the rest in Thyatira, as many as do not have this doctrine, who have not known the depths of Satan, as they say, I will put on you no other burden, but hold fast what you have till I come. And he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. He will rule them with a rod of iron. They shall be dashed into pieces like the potter's vessel, as I also have received from my Father. And I will give to him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, plural. So this church was to the that particular church in Thyatira. It is to the Catholic Church today. It is to all of the churches. And it is to any Christian who has an ear willing to hear. So, in the entire book of Revelation, this is the only place where Jesus refers to himself as the Son of God. Now, in the Jewish mind, uh, they think a little differently than we do. They're more biblical, actually. The son of a person or the son of a place or the son of a thing was called that because it had the nature of that person, place, or thing. A couple of examples. In Isaiah 57, verse 3, it says that the sons of sorcerers had the nature of sorceress or, so, or uh, uh, sorceries. In uh, Mark chapter 3, verse 17, the sons of thunder, John and his brother. Why were they called the sons of thunder? Because they had the nature of thunder. They were short-tempered, impatient. Somebody had a problem with Jesus. They say, hey, rain fire on them. Of course, they changed, didn't they? Their lives were transformed. Uh, John, the apostle, became the apostle of love. Um, and so here in Revelation chapter 2, verse 18, the Son of God, Jesus, is the Son of God for several reasons, but one of the reasons is that He had the divine nature of God. So this is the only place in all of the book of Revelation that He's referred to uh, that way. And this is, of course, in the letter that is written to the church of Thyatira. So why is that? Well, I believe that it's because Catholics view Jesus maybe too often as the son of Mary. And when they do that, they make Mary more than Jesus. And Mary was just a woman. Mary is not greater than Jesus. Uh, maybe a special woman, unique. Maybe she was even a, a holy young woman. But she is certainly not a god. She was a created being. God chose her like he chose anybody else to do the other things he called them to do. It was very special to have given birth to Jesus, no doubt about that. But we can never get away from the fact that Mary was a woman. She has gone to be with the Lord like any other person who has passed from this life to the next. She is not God. And so when we refer to Jesus as the son of Mary, we have to be careful um, not to take away from his divinity, that being, of course, that he is God and he's the son of God. And so uh, continuing on, Jesus reminds the church at Thyatira that he has eyes like a flame of fire and feet like burning brass, meaning what? That he sees everything. The things that we do, he hears the, every word that comes out of our mouth. He knows every single one of our thoughts. There is not one that escapes him. And so brass being the hardest metal in those days, uh, he was immovable. That is, when he returns, he will judge exactly like he says he will judge. He's not going to move from that. You won't be able to negotiate your way out of that. He is the way, the truth, and the life. We get to him, uh, we repent, we are forgiven, and we enter into the kingdom of heaven through him. There is no other way. 
outside of that, you will be judged. Not because he wants to, but because he's God, he must. Well, in some ways, uh, Thyatira uh, was, and, and maybe even today, some would say that the church of Thyatira, the Catholic church, is a model church. Jesus said here, he said, uh, here it is, that they excel in love, in service, in faith, and patience. And if you know Catholicism, they do a lot of good. In fact, I can't think of any church that has cared more consistently for widows and orphans and sick people and starving people. They've built many, not a few, many hospitals and schools around the world. Uh, and they did it at their own expense. They don't ask government for money. They do it at their own expense. And they do it again all over the world. And they do it today more than ever before. And I can think of a few Catholic greats like uh, Mother Teresa, who oversaw the, the orphans and, and, and the orphanages that she began there in Calcutta. Uh, Greg Boyle in East Los Angeles. <clears throat> Never a gang member, but he works with gang members and... Um, and he just, he's always looking to serve the, those gang members and the community, really. In fact, I, I'll tell you, I go there today uh, where most of the world, young people, people who, I don't know, I guess they never really had a past. I, I don't know why they do it, but they go to these tattoo stores and they, they buy tattoos. Hey, put me a tattoo here. Put me a, this person's face and, and put these words on me and, and put the 12 steps on me. And they just can't help it. They just can't help. They even put Bible scriptures on them on their bodies. Um, anyway, we who have been down that path, we know that's a, that's a, that's a big mistake. And, um, so anyway, when I didn't know the tattoos could come off, some of my tattoos were a little offensive and they were done by, uh, by dope fiends. And, uh, a lot of my tattoos were done when I and the person putting them on were, uh, uh, under the influence of heroin. And it's pretty difficult to do a quality tattoo that way. And so, um, at one point, I had somebody do a cover-up on one arm, and then a friend of mine told me about Father Greg Boyle and Homeboy Industries and that I could go there and have my tattoos taken off for free. What? I went down there, man, and I got my entire uh, upper right arm, all of those tattoos uh, removed, tattoo on my chest, um, on my hand also, and then COVID came, and Anyway, I've gone back now, and they're taking the tattoo off of my entire upper uh, right arm. And so, you know, Father Greg Boyle, he didn't have to do that. Um, he didn't have to serve the community in that way. But uh, leave it to the Catholics, man. They uh, and, and they're just relentless. And once they're locked in, man, to the mission field like that, they just continue on. It's, uh, you just don't see that with a lot of churches. Um uh, there's another guy, uh, the I guess he was a, a monk, Catholic monk, uh, Junipero Serra. And he came from Spain to Southern California and worked with the Indians and built uh, missions and introduced them to Jesus Christ and helped them to understand their Bibles. Then, of course, it was uh, St. Francis of Assisi. He was Catholic. He cared for sick people and poor people and even animals. Well, even with all of that going on, Jesus says that this church has a major problem. Go back to verse 20. He says, Nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. And I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality, he says, and she did not repent. And so because of this sentence here, Jesus let her remember, most people believe that the Catholic Church is not going to repent of their doctrine, that they will go through the tribulation. Indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed and those who commit adultery with her into the great tribulation, unless they repent of their deeds, I will kill her children with death. And all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts. And I will give to each one of you according to your works. Well, as I mentioned in the opening, nobody really knows if the church of Thyatira uh, actually had a woman in the church named uh, Jezebel. Some people think that, uh, her, that the woman that the Lord is referring to was not actually a woman named Jezebel, but was maybe the pastor's wife. Or some other woman um, who 
was practicing uh, the ways of Jezebel. Maybe she's the woman who started the church. Nobody really knows. But we do know the way of Jezebel because we know our Old Testament. And so when we get to these places, what we like to do is allow the Bible to speak for itself. And so in the Old Testament, in 1 Kings chapter 16, verse 31, there was a guy named Ahab. You meet him there. He was the king of Israel. And it says that he took as his wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal. Ethbaal, if you remember, Baal was a very popular god in the Old Testament among the pagans, the heathens. And it says that, uh, oh, let me read it again. Uh, Ahab took as his wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, the king of the Sidonians. And he went and served Baal and worshipped him. So Ahab married this wicked woman by the name of Jezebel. Her father was not only the king of the Sidonians, he was also the high priest of Baal. And uh, they worshipped, of course, Baal. Jezebel was the daughter of Ethbaal, the king of the Sidonians, and also high priest of Ashtoreth. Don't forget, if she was the daughter of the king, it made her a type of princess. And this princess, her god, was Ashtoreth, the goddess of what? Sensual pleasure and fertility in the Old Testament. And so Ethbaal gave Jezebel, his daughter, to King Ahab of Israel for the purposes of marriage. Now, if you read the story there in 1 Kings 16, I think it goes all the way to 20, almost immediately when Jezebel became the wife of the king of Israel, which made her the queen, she almost immediately began to influence God's people to worship her gods. Hey, forget about God that Moses introduced you to. Forget about your Bible. Look at these gods here. They'll bring you pleasure and sensuality and you want to have babies everybody in that agricultural uh time wanted to have babies babies were workers they helped around the home a man with a lot of children was a wealthy man and uh, so she began with this uh, movement to influence the people and she was uh very passionate even to the point of murder and it got to a place where she uh murdered thousands of israel's prophets to or that got in her way i should say these people these prophets were preaching truth she was pre preaching a lie she couldn't compete with them so she said just kill them kill them all and in first kings chapter 18 verse 4 let me read it to you first kings chapter 18 verse 4 so it was while jezebel massacred the prophets of the lord that Obadiah, another one of the Lord's prophets, had taken 100 prophets and hid them 50 to a cave and had fed them with bread and water. So 100 of the prophets were saved by this guy, Obadiah. And after that, verses 20 through 40, you could read it there when you have time. They tell us that Elijah, if you remember the prophet Elijah, he met up with Jezebel's priests, those priests of Baal, at a place called Mount Carmel. And it was there that he would, in front of a big audience of people, cause the people to realize who really was God. Was it Baal or was it the God of the Bible? Let's, let's work this thing out. <clears throat> and if you're going with us to Israel in February, we're going to take you to Mount Carmel, beautiful city on a hill, Overlooking the valley of Megiddo, where the uh, Battle of Armageddon will take place, and just a beautiful view. And you know what's interesting is you see these Israeli jets flying in and out of there, but you can't see where the jets are coming from. And you can't see where the jets are coming from because they are parked underground. They are only brought to the surface for takeoff and landing. And so, you know, Israel is surrounded by its Muslim enemies. And uh, Israel has become very uh, in inventive as to their military, technology, and, and other things. It's an interesting place. Anyway, um, this was not uh, the only thing that Jezebel did to offend God. In 1 Kings chapter 21, we're told that she used her power and her position as the queen to steal and extort, extort property and possessions from poor people and defenseless people in Israel. 
Um, so she's guilty of a lot. In fact, going back here a little bit, uh, there at Carmel, Elijah called Ahab and said, listen, there's been a lot going on. Uh, the prophets have been killed. Your wife, the queen, Jezebel, put contracts on all of these prophets. And now we're suffering from a drought. I'll tell you what. Bring the priest of Baal to Mount Carmel. And I'm going to show up there. And we're going to call on our gods to see which God is real. And so they brought up uh, a few hundred priests of Baal to Mount Carmel. And there was Elijah, and there was a whole group of people who wanted to see what was going to happen. So Elijah says, here's what we'll do. You get an offering, you get an animal, kill, bleed the, the, the animal, slaughter him, and put up fire over that altar. And you're going to call on your God, Baal, to bring fire from heaven and consume the offering that you've offered your God. I, on the other hand, I'm going to be over here. I'm going to put together my uh, uh, altar, and I'm going to put wood, and I'm going to place a sacrifice to the God of the Bible. And I'm going to call on our God to uh, bring fire from heaven to consume the animal. You go first. And so the priests of Baal called out to uh, Baal and said, you know, however it was that they prayed. And nothing happened for many hours. Finally, as their practices were, uh, they started to cut themselves and beg Baal to come forward and consume the offerings. They brought nothing happened for hours. Finally, uh, Elijah says, well, it's my turn now. But before I call on my God to consume this offering, I want to have you guys come over and pour water on the wood. We're going to make it even more difficult for my God to answer uh, our prayer. And so that's what they did. And then Elijah called out to God, the God of heaven, the God of Moses. And, and, uh, and sure enough, fire came down from heaven and consumed the offering, licked up all of the water and burned all of the wood. The people stood in utter shock. And at that point, Elijah says, everybody arrest these priests of Baal right now. And he took them down to the bottom of Mount Carmel where there was a, a river. And he killed right there and then hundreds of the, of the priests of Baal. Elijah didn't play. Very serious about uh, his service to the Lord. Well, <clears throat> there is another story in 1 Kings chapter 21 about a poor man named Naboth. And Naboth, he was a poor man and from a poor family and one of his relatives died and he received the inheritance, and it was a little vineyard, nothing big, nothing fancy, a little vineyard, and he loved his little vineyard. He was just grateful for his little vineyard. And uh, Ahab, King Ahab, would look out of his window, and he would admire the little vineyard, and he wanted it for himself. And so in 1 Kings 21, verse 2, I'm going to just read you the story. It says, So Ahab spoke to Naboth, saying, Give me your vineyard that I may have it for a vegetable garden because it's near, next to my house. And for it, I will give you a vineyard better than the one you have. Or if it seems good to you, I will give you its worth in money. But Naboth said to Ahab, The Lord forbid that I should give the inheritance of my father to you. So Ahab went into his house sullen, like a crybaby, that's what it means. And displeased because of the word which Naboth, the Jezreelite, had spoken to him. For he said, I will not give you the inheritance of my fathers. And he lay down on his bed and turned away his face and would eat no food. So this King Ahab was, he was having an actual infant, you know, baby tantrum. And verse 5 says, but Jezebel, his wife, she was the one who wore the pants in the family. His wife came into him and said to him, why is your spirit so sullen that you eat no food? What's going on with you now, little man? And so Jezebel, uh, of course, the false prophetess, uh, one of the most evil women in, in all of the Bible, she devises a plan. And it's in 1 Kings chapter 21, verses 8 through 10. She wrote letters in Ahab's name. So she wrote letters and, and signed them, signed her husband's name to the letters, the king. And she sealed with a seal and went the, and 
sent the letters to the elders and the nobles who were dwelling in the city with Naboth. And she wrote this in the letter, Proclaim a fast, and seat Naboth with high honor among the people, and seat two men, scoundrels, before him to bear witness against him, saying, You have blasphemed God and the king, and then take him out and stone him that he may die. So she plotted against Naboth to bring false charges against him so that she could take him to court and order him to death. It's called an inquisition. It's a fake uh, investigation. It's a mock trial, you know, to bring somebody up on false charges and to find them guilty. And then what happened is they killed Naboth and Ahab got his vineyard. You say, that's a very sad story. It is. And it is the same story repeated over and over and over again in regards to the Catholic Church from the year 600 to 1500 A.D. And from then to now, the Catholic Church is one of the wealthiest organ religious organizations in the world. And guess how much land it owns? 277,000 square miles of land around the world. How did the Catholic Church get that land? Did they go through a real estate agent and pay for that land? Absolutely not. They took it from the people. The people. Poor people. Illiterate people who didn't even know the Bible. Many of them brought up on false charges of heresy. Oh, you don't agree with the Catholic Church? We're coming after you. And they would come after them and uh, by way of punishment or if the Catholic Church had them killed, they would take what they owned. And so it's estimated today, some estimations, are that the Catholic Church is worth about $30 billion. That's right. And never worked for it. No. Took it from people. And that's the truth. You know, church history is a mess. Uh, Pastor Chuck Smith always told us never try to defend church history because the church has been a mess what you can do is speak of jesus christ he's not a mess well in revelation chapter 2 verse uh, 22 jesus says to this church i gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality and she did not repent indeed i will cast her into a sickbed and those who commit adultery with her into the great tribulation. So the sexual immorality here is the spiritual condition of this church where it mixes pagan practices with Christianity. You say, well, what do you mean, Mario? What kind of pagan practices does the Catholic Church uh, practice? What pagan traditions do they hold to? Well, if you remember last week in the study of the Church of Pergamos, which is really the church that set things up, set the stage up for Catholicism. We talked about how pagan, how the pagan religious system that began in Babylon moved to Pergamos. And then when Babylon was destroyed, that became the new home of Satan's empire. And if you remember last week, Jesus said that Pergamos is where Satan's seat was. Well, now in 600 AD, the Roman power and Roman wealth moved from Pergamos to Rome. Well, when the power moves and the money moves, so does religion. Religion always follows the money. And so now the priests, these Roman Catholic priests and the Pope and the cardinals, the bishops and the whole thing, they're no longer in Pergamos. They're no longer in Thyatira. They have moved to Rome where they are this very day. And... The, what they practice, their traditions, are from Babylon, where false religion, paganism, began. You say, well, what, what kind exactly? All right. Why do they baptize babies? Why do Catholics baptize babies? You don't find that anywhere in the Bible. No, you don't. But you find it in the ancient pagan Babylonian religious practices. That's where it came from. And they hold to that. What about rosary beads? Where did rosary beads come from? The Bible didn't talk about rosary beads. Jesus never paid, prayed the rosary bead or promoted that in any way, never even mentioned it. Where does that come from? Again, Babylon, repetitive prayers, priests being celibate, not being married, not having sex with anybody, uh, dressing in black with the white collars, 
uh, if you recall that tall pointy hat that the cardinals wear the top is like a, a triangle like a point that's what that actually is is a fish's tail it's a fish's tail because in babylon well what happened is the pagans would worship the fish god the god of dagon you read about that when you uh, are talking about the philistines the ancient enemies of israel and uh, they were in the temple there and in their temple they had this big statue of dagon and he was half man and he was half fish and that's where they get that hat from it has nothing to do with anything mentioned in the in, in the gospel uh, the worship or, or praying to uh to to mary that to this day many re catholics refer to her as the queen of heaven who was the queen of heaven read the book of jeremiah the jews about 600 to 800 years prior to jesus being born the jews were worshiping the queen of heaven and there was no mary then so where did that come from ancient babylonian religion and that just came and worked its way right into the catholic church and that is the indictment of the catholic church that jesus is speaking of here how about prayers for the dead since when do we pray for dead people and, and, I, and to this day i see it all the time you know pastor mario my brother so-and-so died three weeks ago can you pray for him well no that's not that's in no way a gospel biblical practice uh the bible says that once we die that it's over uh judgment awaits or that individual is in heaven uh only a catholic would pray for the dead because they believe that that dead is in purgatory well again it's it's not biblical it all comes from ancient religion practices pagan practices lighting candles praying to statues none of these things you can find in the bible because they're not biblical these were pagan babylonian religious uh, practices it was a religious system and we're going to talk about that more when we get to revelation chapter 17 because john said in revel i'm going to read it to you now in revelation chapter 17 verses 1 through 6 it says john writes then one of the angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me saying to me come i will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters that is she represents a multitude of people from different nations with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication all of the christians the protestants that the catholics killed were more than the roman empire ever killed so he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness and i saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast remember we talked about that color which was full of names of blasphemy having seven heads and ten horns the woman was arrayed in purple you see the colors thyatira the catholic church babylon and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication and on her forehead a name was written mystery babylon the great the mother of harlots and of the abomination of the earth he says i saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of jesus and when i saw her i marveled with great amazement when you saw her john you saw the colors purple and scarlet you saw that she was a great spiritual whore that led many into paganism and was responsible for the death of countless martyrs why did you marvel when you saw her john that's a question i want to ask him but i think i know the answer i think john recognized her i think when john saw her he saw the catholic church the church from the time of 600 a.d to 1500 a.d he recognized her from the time that jesus gave him the revelation and he was shocked that such a thing had been the outcome of the church 
And so, uh, back to Revelation chapter 2, verse 21, Jesus said, I gave her time to repent, but she did not. And by all accounts, when we read cha uh, Revelation chapter 17, there she is in the middle of the seven years of tribulation because the Catholic Church did not repent and therefore went through the seven years of tribulation. The Catholic Church was not raptured. And so there you have it. Uh, you say, well, Mario, if you're Catholic, that means you're not going to be raptured. If you're Catholic and you hold to their traditions that come from ancient Babylon, that evil place, uh, and you don't repent from that, then, yeah, you're not going to be raptured according to what we read here. You're going to go through the seven years of, uh, of tribulation. Uh, and so, you know, unfortunately, that's the case, but there's still time. You know, when we practice, the reason this is so offensive to Jesus, the reason this is such a serious issue is because, again, when we practice, okay, when we practice uh, sexual sin, fornication, adultery, we're screwing around, we're whoring around. Well, when that happens, STDs, um, sexually transmitted diseases, are a reality. And when we practice spiritual adultery, spiritual sickness is also a reality. And not only the leaders of this religious system, but remember, those who participate and even their generations, that is the generations that follow, who do not repent are going to go through the seven years of tribulation. Well, thank God some of them do repent, some, because look what he says in verse 24, uh, Revelation chapter 2, verse 24. Now to you I say, and to the rest in Thyatira, as many as do not have this doctrine, Catholics who don't hold to all that garbage, who have not known the depths of Satan, that is what Catholics practice these pagan rituals is very very dark and sinister according to jesus you and i might see it one way but jesus doesn't care how we see it he's telling us how he sees it and that's really all that matters when it comes to eternal life and he says or he calls it the depths of satan he says i will put on you no other burden but hold fast to what you have till i come and he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. He's talking about things that are going to happen during the millennium. We'll get to that in Revelation chapter 20. They shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessel, as I also have received from my father. And I will give him the morning star. <coughs> he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So this letter is to the church of Thyatira. Again, the Catholic church, no doubt about it. And again, to all the churches and to us individually. And the warning here is this. Stay true to the Bible. And if you're not reading your Bible, if you're not part of a ministry that is teaching you the whole Bible, <coughs> there's no way that you can stay true to the Bible. But that's what he wants us to do. He wants us to give priority over traditions of men and religion and otherwise give him <coughs> scripturally, biblically, the priority of our lives. In verse 16, in Revelation 22, verse 16, I should say, we're told there that Jesus is the bright morning star. So what he's saying in Revelation 2 is that Jesus is offering the reward of what? Himself to those who overcome. <coughs> An experience of unexplainable intimacy with Jesus. Also, he says, to those who overcome, those who lean not on their own understanding or on false religious ways and traditions, not to them, but to those who overcome, they will have a part in the kingdom and power of heaven. So the effort is well worth it. And let me just give you the end of the end of the story, because it doesn't end in the book of Revelation. In the book of Zechariah, I believe it's chapter 4, it says that in the final days, after the seven years of tribulation, after the battle of Armageddon, after all of those things, before there's a new heaven and a new earth, it says that two storks, uh, Zechariah had this vision, two storks, there is a woven basket, a stork on the left, a stork on the right. 
a woman, an evil woman is put into the basket and there is a lead covering put on top of the basket. And two storks, all right? When you read the book of Leviticus, storks are an unclean animal. Two storks fly that evil woman. You want to call her Jezebel. You want to call her the great harlot from the book of Revelation, whatever it is. That evil woman, that evil religious system, that pagan Babylonian system is flowing. The two storks fly it in the basket from where it was back to its beginning. And it says that its beginning was the land of Shinar. What is the capital? If Shinar is the land or the county, what is the capital? Babylon. Babylon. That's where it came from. That's where it'll end up. You want to study more about Babylon, the beginnings of all these pagan religious practices? Genesis chapter 11. That's where it began. God is going to see to it that one day that whole system returns to that place. Father, Thank you so much for guarding over our lives. There is time to repent, Father. I pray that for myself and every listener that you would give us a heart to repent, Father. A mind. Give us eyes to see the evil, the darkness that we still compromise, that we still toy with and play with because we think we have time because we say you're gracious and merciful. Well, you are gracious and you are merciful, but you're not dumb. You're not ignorant and you're not blind, Lord. You see what is going on in the lives of the Christian in, in, Christians individually and all of the churches, Father. May there be a deep, heavy spirit of repentance on us. And may revival come as a result, Father. Lord, I pray that in my own life, there would be no more compromise, Father. No more just a pure worship of your son, Jesus, that my life, Father, and the lives of those listening would be lives that worship you in spirit and in truth, both by word, by thought, and deed. In Jesus' name, Father, we thank you. Amen and amen. Oh, Jesus.